Chapman, and welcome to the Homelessness and Poverty Committee. Uh, I am joined by colleagues David Rue and Monica Rodriguez. Uh, we have a quorum. Uh, we can begin this meeting, and uh, we're going to start with general public comment. We have Mr. Todd Lipka uh, to give general public comment. Um, you're the entire universe today of public commenters so far, so welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Todd Lipka, CEO for Step Up on Second. We're part of the development entity that has a number of HHH projects in the pipeline, including two on the VA property and uh, several motel conversions. And I know one of these motel conversions has come to you. As a developer, it's very, very challenging to develop permanent supportive housing projects. With a homeless population of veterans at about 3,600 across the county, we're developing uh, over 300 units, new units of uh, veteran housing. In LA, it costs about half a million dollars a unit, and it takes about four or five years to develop permanent supportive housing. The motel conversion ordinance is fantastic. We're totally in support of it. We think motels, it's, it's all about scaling, because developing these projects when they cost so much and take so much, any avenues to scale are ones we should be pursuing aggressively. And the motel conversion is uh, certainly one of them. So the, we really support removing the impediments to, those, to get those projects online. Thank you, Mr. Lipka. Really appreciate it. All right, next we have Antonio Ramirez, who has filled out a general public comment and items three and four. And you have uh, one minute for general public comment and two minutes for your items. Okay, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, being homeless is not easy. It is expensive. And um, what I have been struggling with being homeless is not only the gang stalking, but also the violence. Violence against women. All I hear are women crying and screaming and yelling for help. When we call the LAPD, God bless the LAPD, um, sometimes they can help you, sometimes they can't. It is difficult. You see a lot of violence. I experience the urination on my tent when I'm asleep at night on a nightly basis. Um, I am goddamn pissed off. I got a lot of people because they retaliate against me, especially the fucking Latino wetbacks and gangbangers and the uh, niggers. Those are the two primary assholes that urinate, attack, beat, and rob. Not only me, but a lot of the women. This has to stop. We need to put an emphasis on stopping the violence against women by Latino you know, chango gangbangers and fucking wetbacks and niggers. It's got to stop. And um, that's what gets me angry. Nobody is doing nothing. There is no public safety. And a lot of it is also with drugs. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't smoke. But I am deeply immersed in all that crap. And how do I get out of it? How do I swim out of this abyss? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of smelling the stink bombs, the despicable pigs. They don't wash bath clean. Uh, it's like being in a land of, in a jungle. Jane Goodall could do a better job than all the, all of all the city council and mayor and all of them put together. She, uh, she's lived in the jungle. We, I, I mean, we are savages here in this, in, in city of Los Angeles. And God, I don't want to become a savage. I don't want to be a, a, a despicable, but it, I bring what's out there to the forefront so everybody could see the shit we go through every night. I, living in a tent, have to be urinated and have to live with all these plastics and tarps all over inside. I barely can breathe in there. So every now and then I'll catch some breath from my uh, little exposed part of my tent and then go back and uh, uh, I wake up so tired in the morning and I'm just, I can't deal with this. God damn, I'm so fucking pissed off. And this is a shit I deal with every goddamn night. And um, and I have to hide the way I put my tent because the fucking gangbangers and the wetbacks and the niggers all in the white trash, they make the routes to see where I'm going, how I'm putting my tent, how I'm putting it, how I'm taking it down. And I say, get the fuck out of my face, you fucking wetbacks and gangbangers. I get the fuck or I'm going to call immigration or I call LAPD. This is a shit I go through as a homeless woman every night and I'm not alone. I hate living like this, but this is the way I live. If I could fucking pick up every fucking gangbanger, if I had a bazooka, I'd blow every fucking gangbanger and wet back down to smithereens. That's how women feel out there. We are in pain, we are tortured, we are terrorized, and we are obliterated every fucking day and night. You. God bless joined. America, God bless Donald We are joined Trump. by Marquise Harris-Dawson and Mike Bonin. Uh, 
colleagues, what I'd like to do is, since there are no other comment cards on items one and three, take those two items on consent, one and three, if there are no objections. Seeing as there are no objections, that is what we shall do. Uh, and Ms. Amatya, please read item number two. Item, num item number two, CAO report relative to the Prop HHH Administrative Oversight Committee recommendations for the Proposition HHH Permanent Supportive Housing Project Expenditure Plan for Fiscal Year 2019-20 and authorization to reprogram Prop HHH bond funds. Thank you. And I understand we have the CAO to report today. Welcome, and uh, whomever would like to begin. Just by way of introduction, Meg Barclay, um, City Administrative Officer, City Homeless Coordinator. Uh, before you is the project expenditure plan for fiscal year 2019-20. Um, I will let each said provide the details on the projects and the process for getting to this, but the uh, we will the CAO does not at this time recommend issuing bonds this year. Uh, to support these projects. We can uh, pay for any costs associated with projects in this PEP and the two PEPs that have been approved in the prior two years with the proceeds that were issued in 2017 and 2018. Um, if we do need additional funds, uh, we will come forward and to request a general fund loan to be paid back with future bond proceeds. Uh, the report before you also provides an additional instruction recommended by the um, Administrative Oversight Committee to facilitate this reprogramming. I'm, T I'm Tim Elliott, the development manager at H. Said uh, we're recommending 27 projects be uh, uh, entered into the 1920-20 uh, um, project expenditure plan or PEP. Um, there's, there's currently 33 projects that are that are in project prior project expenditure plans. This would bring that number up to 60. Um, but there are currently uh, 79 projects in the HHH pipeline. So there's there'll be after this there'll still be 19 that are. Um, that don't have full funding and won't be included in, in a PEP until, um, in, until such time that we know that they can start in the next, uh, in the next fiscal year. So this PEP uh, would include $281 million in, um, in bond proceeds, which would bring uh, the, all the project expenditure plans up to or $593 million. Um, so these 27 projects have 1,785 um, housing units. 1,415 of those, or 80 percent, are supportive housing. Um, and there's another 341 that'll just be uh, regular uh, affordable housing. Um, these projects are located all over the city in 12 different council districts. And um, seven of them are, are in what we call high or highest resource areas, uh, which is a, a HUD-defined term. Um, 20 of these projects received uh, commitments uh, in the current fiscal year, including five that just got approved, that came in ready. Um, and there are seven that were not included in a prior expenditure plan, uh, but are included in, in this one. Um, so these, these 27 projects should be able to start construction within the next fiscal year, which is why they're... Within the next year? Within the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why they're on here. And, but the money will go out over the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, they'll, th these projects will support uh, in directly or indirectly 8,200 jobs, and that's a, an average of 316 jobs per project. And, but no money will be dispersed until uh, loans are closed and, and regulatory agreements are recorded. So we're available to answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much. And that's a lot of numbers that are in this report and then a lot of numbers you just threw out. Um, when you take the cumulative total, including the uh, soon-to-be-approved um, projects, what number of housing units does that get us to? It's 5308. Something along those lines. I think it's 5308, of which 4120 are supportive housing. And the others are extremely low income. Right. They're all. They're. They're not. They're all uh, income restricted. Mm -hmm. So when you add the two together, it's exactly 53, uh, 5,388 units. They're all, of, they're all affordable. Uh, um, 
uh, units with covenants. And, mm -hmm. so. and uh, what will be the balance of HHH funds after all of this? So we just closed a round, and what was available was approximately $204 million. We received 45 applications in this last round for a total request. I have on top of my head $369 million. Um, so uh, basically, the what we'll call is the scoring and the tiebreaker will be instituted so that each of these projects will be ranked and scored by the five priorities that are already inside our regulations and scored. And in case someone ends up with a, a similar score, there'll be a tiebreaker if that's necessary as well, which mm -hmm. is tied to cost. Um, colleagues, questions? Mr. Rue? I'm sorry, that was 5,388. And the two breakdown was what for what? I'm sorry, what? The two breakdowns, permanent supportive housing versus... 400 and... It's 4,120 supportive housing units, 100 and... Uh, it says 194 affordable units, and then 87 manager's units. So it might be 187. 87, I'm sorry? 87 manager units. Okay, manager units. Okay. Um, I, I saw a number somewhere else that was 7,000-something. Is that including... Um, Mayor's Bridge Home and all of that? Or? No, it is not. So when you count the existing pipeline that we do without HHH, we have always and continue to produce uh, supportive housing through our regular program. Mm. And part of that program was designed to basically, um, we were looking at 300 units a year. When you do the 300 times 10, that's the 3,000 plus 7,000 brings you to 10,000 units. So when, when you're looking at our pipeline and you look at what's been completed and coming online, that's where that additional number is coming from. Okay. And, and just for those who aren't uh, familiar with in the audience uh, as well, is HSID on its uh, website has its dashboard, so anybody can follow progress at any moment in time and see that breakdown as well. And they can, it has information that's actually downloadable into Excel spreadsheet if they want to track that way as well, mm -hmm. and a map so you can see wherever they are. Great. So, uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. No. So, so notwithstanding the 120 million for the innovation. Um, part of, of the allocation of the funding. Uh, what do you see? Do you see another round after this one or two or, is, or maybe? So notwithstanding the, the 120, we had about $204 million to do. And so this round coming back in at 369 means we're fully oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. What I fully suspect is we will go through the early commitments you know, we live in a world that's not perfect. Not every deal is going to make it. These are highly complicated, and we expect some won't meet their timelines or fall apart, and that's, right. that's how traditional development works. And so I would suspect either late in this calendar year or probably next, the beginning of next fiscal year that on the same calendar that we do three, months, uh, three cycles a year that we would take a look and see what covenants, I mean, uh, what commitment letters fell off because they mm -hmm. were for two years and where the money sits that came back and then make adjustments there. We also expect with no place like home and others that that might free up additional funds mm -hmm. for us as well because uh, HH, not as much HHH would be required. And so we will incorporate that into that. And so we will take a look at what proceeds are available at that time. But we will monitor through the year, but I don't expect it until sometime at the uh, beginning of next year. But we, we do expect not everyone who applied to be able to uh, carry through on, on the, their well, that, that's the that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. That hasn't happened yet. Okay. Hasn't happened yet. I don't know right. what the percentage is, but there isn't a percentage. The, right. They're, they're all, you know, the, the first batch are all moving forward and should close construction loans by the end of the calendar year. All right. And how much time do you give from the letter, the commitment letter to the actual? Uh, you have a, the two commitment's years. two years. Two years. You have two years. All right. And so it's enough time to give you to get through other funding cycles. So most, a lot of funding cycles, unfortunately, have been on an annual basis. For the last couple of years, there weren't any other funding sources around for the most part. Um, now others are coming online. Two years will be more than adequate to, to get there. The challenge is if you can get all your numbers um, to align with all your entitlements and your construction costs. And we still are dealing with increasing construction costs, increasing materials costs, and just pure logistics of getting projects to work. Mm -hmm. Those are, mm -hmm. So... Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rodriguez, Mr. Bonin. All right. Thank you. So I, yeah, oh, yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, I was inspired by the line of questions you were asking, because uh, I'm concerned about a, another related thing to this question, um, about how much resources we have to go. Um, so 
recently you all released data about our um, progress towards the, the 222 goal, right? Yes. And so, you know, I was a little bit under, some people were over, some people were, some council districts are way under. And I just was concerned that if the, the council districts that are, have a ways to go, will we run into a problem where there won't be money for people to do that if we continue like we've been going? That's a fair question. Uh, Thank you for that. <laughs> no, that's a fair question. I, I don't have that report in front of me that showed all the, all the, yeah. the particular numbers, but uh, we, I'd have to go back through and take a look at uh, how many were slotted in each, uh, particularly after this last round, this current round, how many were slotted for each project, uh, each uh, council district, to see where we are potentially. But the answer to your question is that potential does exist, and if and if that holds true, and it, I'll call that as a if. We still have the traditional pipeline for which we can do supportive housing and have done supportive housing. In addition, with the fact that the county has um, its no place like home funds coming online, and most of those will be also using 4% bonds and conduit here through the city, um, we will see those deals. They just may not have our HHH dollars in them, but they will, have, they will have gone through the city, and we will either have some other money or they may not need our money depending on how they've structured them if they grab state funds and, and uh, no place like home. More options are available than when we started, and that's very helpful. Well, that's mm -hmm. that's great. I just, um, yeah, I just, I, I would love uh, you all's guidance on that in the future, just so we, ha and, and, and again, not that we take action on it one way or another, but just so we know. So, you know, I mean, if Mr. O'Farrell keeps building at the same pace, then, you know, there won't be... Money for Mr. Rue to build. So. That's that's the plan. No, yeah. I mean, but it's you know it's something that we got to take a look at because I yeah. we after we made this big commitment, all of us, which I thought was a great thing for every member to do, you don't want to go back to the voters and say, oh well, we didn't anticipate this. Mm -hmm. Great question, Mr. Rue. And also, um, for for the record, I also want to state. And, and I think Councilman um, Marcus Aristotle was saying it nicely, but every council office and every council member unanimously committed to that. So, um, and I think it's very important that uh, this is a citywide problem. It's not a Venice Beach problem or a Hollywood problem or a, um, a Skid Row problem. It's a city of LA problem. And I think every part of the city of Los Angeles and every council district has to step up. And I think, um, uh, we want to make sure that there is enough money for every council office, because I know every council office does want to step up uh, to be able to afford them the ability. And I know our mayor is putting some extra money on um, from the general fund as well. But I um, mean, for the record, I, I think every council office must do something. Thank we you. want want the new council member for CD12 to have the opportunity right. to <laughs> deliver for right. his or her constituents. Right. Right. Very good. It's all share and share alike, right? Fair enough. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, approve the report with no objection, and we'll spread the love. Uh, and that brings us to, uh, to item four. And uh, please read the item. item. Item number four continued from March 20, 2019. Proposition HHH Administrative Oversight Committee Report and Joint Report from the CAO and Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department relative to the Prop HHH Housing Challenge Request for Proposals. All right, and don't go anywhere because we have one speaker. We're going to hear from Matt Nichols on this item. Matt Nichols, come on up, and you have uh, you're the the one one person who's filled a card on this item, and then we'll uh, we'll go into the item. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. My name is Matt Nichols, here with DLA Piper on behalf of um, the variety of affordable developer clients we represent. Um, the HHH housing challenge is before us because we're in a crisis. We need to figure out how to deliver affordable units quicker and cheaper than we've done before. Um, I submitted a letter today, um, passed out in hard copy and emailed it as well, um, which points out in a point in the existing RFP language 
that we feel is slowing down <coughs> the delivery of housing, and we offer a suggested change to fix this. In its current form, the RFP, like the traditional loan program, offers no flexibility in terms of issuer options. It mandates that housing be the sole authorized bond issuer. Um, under the traditional loan program, this has already created a bottleneck, which has resulted in significant time lags for numerous projects. Uh, we would recommend that under the RFP, applicants be authorized to utilize outside issuers of tax exempt bonds through an opt-out <coughs> opt procedure or application to a body like the HHH Oversight Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have representatives from City Attorney's Office, H. Sit in the Mayor's Office. Um, please um, begin. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us back. Uh, ben Winter from the Mayor's Office. Um, uh, the CAO just transmitted to you all a report, I think it was last week, right, Yolanda? Mm -hmm. um, uh, with a little bit of uh, more details that you've requested on the scoring process and also a new redlined RFP for your consideration that addresses um, uh, hopefully all the concerns and questions that uh, this body raised last week. And with that, I think I'd like to pass it over to Sean Spear, Assistant General Manager from HCID, to go over those proposed changes. Okay. Good afternoon, Council Members. Hello. Um, so as uh, Ben outlined, there are a set of changes uh, pursuant to the last uh, Homeless and Poverty Committee meeting in which you presented three items that you wanted incorporated into the RFP. Uh, we have uh, included language to address those, as well as a fourth item related to uh, comments received from uh, Councilman Harris Dawson um, concerning the community involvement process. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute just to kind of go through uh, the changes and highlight the issue and how they're being addressed. So specifically on four, page four, uh, there was comments made regarding the uh, $120 million that's earmarked for this uh, innovation program, but identifying that there may be a possibility that we may ultimately come up with proposals less than that $120 million. And so the, the language was uh, changed uh, very slightly on that page. Moving forward to page six, there was additional language that, in, in part, we wanted to comprehensively address the question around uh, potential displacement of uh, existing tenants. And uh, hearing very loudly both the recommendation from the AOC as well as the council about making, making it clear that there would be no relocation or permanent relocation for of folks that are existing occupied units. So actually we uh, incorporated language that spells out uh, specifically how temporary relocation is addressed as well as reinforcing that there's to be no permanent re relocation uh, for tenants. So that page carrying forward into the top of page uh, seven addresses so those concerns. This is, I would point out that this is actually slightly more restrictive than um, what is currently in the HHH guidelines because we wanted to make it absolutely clear that there's to be no permanent relocation here. Moving on to page eight, uh, there's uh, some minor um, format uh, changes, but also to identify that um, and to make it clear pursuant to some further guidance from the city attorney's office around this question of ability to be exempt from prevailing wage, that that uh, provision as spelled out in state law um, specifies that it's, you can possibly have just a single public, I'm sorry, single source of public financing in which you might meet that exemption test, but we wanted to make it clear that um, other operational public funds, such as Section 8 and other things that may be coming from other uh, agencies, would also qualify as public funds in addition to HHH, so therefore they would not be eligible for that exception. Um, Mike can sort of add to that in color if you have any questions related to that piece, but in effect what we think is that it just needs to specify that any public funds, whether they're for the construction of the projects or the operations, the ongoing operations of the projects would um, meet that test. Skipping forward to page 10, uh, there were clarifications around uh, the review process and maybe it'll take a minute for uh, Yolanda can give you a little bit more detail on our approach there. Sure. Um, good afternoon, Yolanda Chavez with the CAO's office. You know, one of the things that we wanted to ensure that applicants were aware of is that if the project is not financially feasible, it should not move forward. 
I think we discussed at the last meeting that, again, these are general obligation bonds. I think the public speaker, in fact, was a little confused because we're talking about general obliga obligation bonds, which are issued by the CAO, not HCID. So I think he was maybe confusing the type of bonds we're talking about in terms of the funding. But um, so we changed the scoring a little bit so that the financial structure and cost efficiency um, had a score which by if a project is deemed or I should say a proposal is deemed financially infeasible, they could not meet the minimum score to move forward. So minimum score of 75. That was one of the key changes. And to do that, we adjusted the scoring on some of the other categories. Okay. Thanks. Um, moving a little bit further on that page, we then sort of outlined in the table presented a shift in terms of the uh, points allowed for each of the scoring categories and the introduction of a seventh uh, scoring category around community engagement. So these changes were pursuant to your instructions about emphasizing, um, having greater emphasis around the design and making sure that, that there are quality designs that come forward through the process, as well as um, making it clear about the opportunities to um, basically have the, the scoring criteria favor deals that are moving forward through the process in a more streamlined manner as well. So the succeeding pages then are some adjustments related to just those changes in the scoring criteria. And also then you can find towards the page uh, 24 uh, information on the new community outreach um, scoring um, category. And basically uh, information that then would flow uh, related to that and that the respondents will need to specifically address how they are uh, engaging the community. And just, and just to finish, the other question that you asked clarification on was the review and selection process. And so in the report, the very brief report back on page two, we outlined what would be envisioned in terms of the selection process. Just wanted to point out that, of course, a critical phase is the underwriting phase to ensure a project is financially feasible. Um, we wanted to ensure there's confirmation of that, so there'd be a second review of any project that's considered to be financially infeasible to ensure that we're really re reviewing these carefully and that everybody has an opportunity to be able to compete. Um, and then, of course, if um, HCID uh, chooses to add non-city staff to a panel of experts, they would have to be vetted by the city attorney to ensure there's no conflict of interest. But this gives you a brief outline of the review and selection process. And um, there were two additional small changes that uh, we've uh, forgot to mention here. But one was, uh, again, in response to the design consideration, we, in shifting some of the points, we added more points to the, to the design panel review. And we also clarified the, uh, the title for the uh, evaluation criteria number five. Uh, to show, you know, we're giving more points for people that uh, choose streamlined entitlement uh, paths, not just what's up to the city's uh, ability and how fast we permit something or process uh, building permits. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, to, to kind of recap, when we heard this in committee last time, we talked about more details and clarification in regard to the review panels, its makeup, um, also the design, which uh, you've addressed, um, uh, and then an emphasis on displacement and what those requirements are uh, for, for that. So, so I appreciate your report, and um, it's, it's very comprehensive. Um, well, during the last committee hearing, we also talked about uh, the plan uh, in the RFP for no cap on the additional funds, the HHH funds, in excess of 140,000 per unit, um, and how that could potentially affect the amount of units that we could build with this innovation pot. Um, any changes in the RFP re in relation to that? Uh, there are no changes contemplated in the RFP, um, draft changes. Um, of course, we are, uh, would welcome 
any additional feedback or discussion there. I think there's different ways that we could look at this. Uh, the way that it's currently written is we would contemplate allowing an incremental subsidy per unit if uh, the projects can demonstrate a feasible way to pay back that increment with a, some alternative form of perm financing uh, within three years of project completion. So you could, in theory, uh, make that a little bit more nuanced. So you could say, you know, we'll, you know, we could cap that up to $220,000 uh, per door if you're paying it back within three years. Um, or if you're going to pay it back within one year, there is no cap. So you could kind of do a little bit more of a nuance there if that's your desire. But ultimately, as Yolanda mentioned, um, you know, we'd like to see from the proposals what that is, what is that perm source. And so that will, whatever uh, anybody brings to us, we'll make sure that it really is evaluated and made, made by underwriters to make sure that it is a feasible option to pay back. And when you issue an RFP, how long is the timeline for that? For, for them yeah, to, to review? Yeah, to award, uh, to review and, and award. So we're hoping, um, we're targeting about uh, allowing this to be open for about five weeks, which is pretty aggressive, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but we think that various drafts of this is, have been out there in the public already, so people have already been contemplating what they're going to do. Um, and then hopefully a review process of about a, hopefully around a month um, and before it comes back. Sean's laughing because that also is pretty aggressive. Uh, it really depends on how many proposals we see, right? Mm -hmm. We get 100 proposals, which I doubt it, um, would take longer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and, and so from the time someone um, makes a, a commitment proposal to you and to the time that they can have their project fully funded, uh, what's that time frame? We just heard previously that it's a, a two-year time frame for the typical HHH process. <clears throat> what would it be for this one? So in this one, it's a little different because the emphasis here is on time and cost. Uh, the conditional approvals are 12-month oh, yeah. conditions rather than 24 months. Um, and that's if somebody's coming in with an individual project. If somebody's coming in with a development strategy and we decide to do enterprise level funding to a team uh, that they, you know, go out and find parcels, then that initial kind of reservation it would only be available for about four months, which is pretty aggressive. So anybody who's choosing that path, we're hoping that they are coming in with sites that, you know, are potentially already under option, for instance. Um, so that would be, so then they'd have four months to bring them under site control, in which case it would convert for individual projects to a 12-month conditional approval. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, a, it is more aggressive than the traditional Triple H pipeline in that sense. But that's the whole purpose, isn't it, that this is more aggressive in general, right? That's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, question for H. Said, how long does it take a project to get through your, uh, your managed pipeline for the issuance of tax-exempt bonds? Yeah, so the advantage is actually um, with these deals pursuing taxes and bonds, they're not going through the managed pipeline. So literally, we are talking to the developers to determine what their time frame is in terms of when they're, they are permit ready and have secured their other sources of financing and are ready to go. Uh, thus far, we have issued bonds for deals as they have been ready to go. Um, there has not been a delay in terms of processing on our side. What if there is a misalignment of timelines that have to be met um, where they cobble together and secure their other sources of funding, but HSID hasn't yet um, met that timeline? Is there an alternative approach? We haven't encountered that and would not anticipate encountering that. Mm -hmm. We work very closely with the developers to determine their time frame. We then uh, basically work through the process in terms of identifying when we need to come to you for approval of the bond tr issuance. And usually it's pretty seamless on our side. We have um, not only, I would point out, it's not only the HHH staff that are dedicated to this program. Our bond unit is doing 100% of their work is related to this program, as well as our managed pipeline staff are working on these deals. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, colleagues, questions? Mr. Bonin. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, uh, and I apologize because I wasn't here at the previous committee meeting when we discussed this. Um, uh, I've got a lot of questions and concerns, and some of them may 
differ than what you were asked to do last time. So just maybe. <laughs> <laughs> may, may, Round two. May, 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 maybe where it is. But um, so just generally, you know, the, the, whole, the whole point of this was to do things more cost effectively and faster than we usually do. Uh, and to be more creative, get outside the box, and get outside of the, the way we know how to do things. And so there's some stuff in here that concerns me. There's, there's some stuff that seems really, really vague, and then there's some stuff that seems really, really prescriptive. Uh, and uh, both of those, I think, would be better if they moved into sort of the Goldilocks zone and were uh, a little between the, the vague and the prescriptive. The um, uh, let, me, let me first ask a question about the relocation stuff. I, I, I love that that's in there. I just want to make sure that it, it gets to where we want it to be. Um, on that is the requirement, if there are displaced, temporarily displaced people, is there a requirement that they be relocated or a requirement that they be offered relocation funding and assistance? Uh, specifically, as in our programs in general, the um, developer produces a relocation plan. They usually have a relocation consultant. They identify and work with the tenants in terms of their needs for relocation. It may depend on how long they are expected to be out of their unit while that re rehabilitation work may be ongoing. So sometimes it can be literally a matter of a couple days. In such cases, you know, they may be put up at a motel or something like that, that the developer and that relocation consultant actually help identify for them. Other times it may mean that in a longer scenario that um, they could be relocated for a month or two. And in those cases, usually, um, again, they're usually working with those tenants to actually find a temporary place to live and then come back. But usually it's not extended periods of time on a rehabilitation deal. I understand the usual. I'm just, I'm just, I, I... I, I want to make sure there's not a gap between our intention and the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know, you know, my district is more expensive than others, and, and many of these will probably happen in, in other parts of, 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 of the city, uh, hopefully some in mind. But when we have a, an issue of, of relocation, it, it tends to be a real struggle for people to find some place near their kid's school mm -hmm. or near their doctor or their workplace. So... Um, I don't want folks to inadvertently get bumped into homelessness while we're trying to build homeless housing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, how can I be assured that people will actually be relocated as opposed to just being offered a check that ain't going to be enough? No, it's not that they're just offered a check and asked to go and find housing themselves. Specifically, the staff of the developer work very closely with that family or individual to find housing, to identify it make sure their moving expenses are covered, that they are actually covered throughout that process. They are checked throughout that process and brought back when the unit is ready. Can we require them to, to actually do the relocation as opposed to making the offer? Essentially, we already do under the law. But, I, you know, I would add the difference in the language in this RFP mm -hmm. is that you cannot displace permanently. So that means that if you are going to relocate someone on a temporary basis, you have to ensure that that household will qualify for the new unit that you're building or rehabbing. And so if you can't ensure that, then you can't displace, so then you're, you're basically displacing them. And if you can displace, then your proposal is not, wouldn't be eligible under this RFP. Yeah, so this is much sure stricter. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between temporary and permanent exactly. displacement. Exactly. Yes. I want to make sure they're not temporarily Displaced. out on the street or living in their vehicle. No, right. uh, that does right. not occur. It's by law, and mm. I mean by law as well as they have people that specialize in dealing with this. Okay. It's, and, and it's codified in a relocation plan that they present when they submit their application. Okay. Now let me ask about the the displacement. Um, you you. You, you don't qualify for funds unless you're essentially creating an increase in units, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, du double. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I did, I did, that was my c concern. I, I, I didn't want us to have somebody add two units and, and, and get a ton of money. Yes. Mm -hmm. On, on uh, page six. So under the current Triple H program, the requirement is if uh, a, an HHH deal entails the redevelopment of existing housing or if it's an ACRE have deal 
then the resulting project would have to produce 100% units. In other words, um, double. Do you get uh, more points for more units and fewer points for fewer units? No, I think it's just no. meeting, uh, meeting that standard. No, but I mean, I think the way that this RFP is structured, you know, everybody, we're all very, um, we're all really um, working towards meeting our 10,000 permanent supportive housing unit goal, right? So the way that this RFP is structured, the funding would only be um, uh, the maximum loan amount or award amount will be determined by the number of supportive housing units in the project, right? So if if your project has to entail dis a temporary displacement, right? Let's say you've got uh, one one unit that you're you know doing and uh, that you're redeveloping, and your final project is two units, you have to provide on site the ability for that person to come back, right? So, in theory, uh, you're only allowed to get one unit of funding. So you're not going to be double dipping, if, you, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. So there's no point system, but in, it, in the way that it works mathematically, you're not going to be funding the Triple H money for projects that were, was already supposed to be there. All right. That's what I wanted to make sure of. Yep. Um, I was glad to see that uh, in the sort of modalities that were permitted, uh, shared housing was there, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really curious, having read the criteria, how any shared housing could qualify. Um, uh, and I'll ask a couple questions to, to sort of explain that. Uh, first, how do you define a unit? So the unit is going to be a complete unit. It's going to have uh, space, living space, as well as prescribed bathroom and kitchen space, at least kitchen appliances. So if there were a, a model that had a shared common living space of a kitchen and a living room, but four bedrooms, four different tenants, is that counted? That would qualify? Yes. Uh, and would get the same number of points as a unit that houses one people with one kitchen or more? Yes, it would. We're not providing any difference in, in points based upon how many bedrooms the unit may have or so, if they don't have any bedrooms at all. Right, but if we, if we were just talking a second ago about you, you, you essentially wind up as a result of the process getting more money for housing more people. If a unit were to house four people, that mm -hmm. doesn't get any, any more weight than something that houses one person. No, it's by the unit. Okay. It's measured by the unit, by, not by the person. Why? Both in terms of what's kind of considered industry standard, in terms of how financing programs work, they look at the number of units. So other resources as well will typically look at funding per unit, on, particularly in the public resources. You could also make the argument, I mean, we've seen anecdotally, you know, um, in a shared a shared environment that you're describing, sometimes that tends to be a lower TDC or a, low, a lower per unit subsidy because um, if you're requiring a, you know, a studio for everybody that's more plumbing and more, you know, you're, you're making sure everybody has their own kitchen, everybody has their own bathroom, and so that, that increases the cost. And so then that person, that developer is probably going to be requesting more Triple H dollars per unit and therefore uh, score maybe less than somebody who's coming in with a more shared. And I would point out in that, in that respect, the, the program becomes agnostic in terms of whether or not it's shared versus a family. So you may have a three or let's say a four bedroomed shared unit that gets the same amount of dollars as would be a four bedroom that may serve that same number of in a family setting. It's otherwise they're treated equally as far as the funding is concerned. Hear that? My I, my uh, my son would put it this way. My spidey sense goes off uh, when I hear in a discussion about this, it, modeling after the industry standard. Because I think what we're trying to do here is do something different than the, the city standard and the industry standard. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, next question uh, on the because that was about the unit amenities uh, on the panel uh, design review scoring. Um, it, 
it does, it's not very clear on how you would actually score those points. It, it, it seems pretty subjective. Uh, what guidance are we giving people so they know, oh, if I do this, I'm more likely to get three or four points as opposed to I do this, I'm likely to get eight or nine points. So as with some of the other feasibility review, you know, after this is um, passed and we kind of put together the selection panel um, and ask staff to actually kind of dedicate a good chunk of their time to specifically to this, we're going to be developing specific rubric for each of these um, uh, these sections that seem a little bit more subjective than, you know, something that's very objective like the number of subsidy that you're that you're asking for. So I think uh, some of those those uh, details on the rubric will be worked out um, when we have the review panel staffed up and determined. Anything else? But won't they have already submitted something by then? Uh, we, I mean, we still have, after this is passed by council, we'll have two weeks, um, probably two weeks before it's actually out there, um, sub submitted, you know, live, and then we'll have about a five-week application period. So that's seven weeks to develop the rubrics. So bef before this gets released, the rubrics will be established, or...? while but it's released. But I think, um, and maybe that would correct me, yeah, sure. I think that if you look at the different, um, so for unit amenities, right, so the three, and there's a list of items. And so what Ben is saying is that the, I mean, we could always do it before it's released where it's very specific. If you have this, you get one point. If you're not including, um, what's a design? So it's if you're not including one design aspect, you'd get, Two, so I mean that's what he's talking about. I'm not clear what. So you think the zero to three or zero to five is not well, I, specific? I mean, enough. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that you're the, telling people how you're grading them, and what right. what disturbs me a little bit more is is the answer to my question, which is that while the process is underway, you're going to tell them. Like a after they may have submitted, you'll tell them what the criteria is. The, so I think if you think something here is not specific enough we need to outline we'll it before it's released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, people need to know the rules. Yes. Yeah. Um, another question is, um, under organizational structure, experience, and capacity, the scoring uh, criteria, uh, if I'm not mistaken, limits the developer pool to already known entities to HCID, scoring them two points higher than developers who've not received financing through the city. If, if somebody's received financing through the the county, the state of California, neighboring jurisdiction, why do they have to have had experience with the city to get those points? I mean, we're trying to do things differently. And they receive the points that? for whether or not they've done multifamily housing. That's the first bullet. They get additional points, additional two, if they've done stuff within the city of Los Angeles. Right, why? It speaks to local experience speaks to ability to navigate the development process within the city of Los Angeles, as well as specifically has done loans and is familiar with the loan agreements that we put forward and the restrictions that we require in our projects. So the restrictive covenants as well. It's additional points, they qualify, but if you want to, and they qualify, they have the ability to get that first three points just for doing projects in general regardless of where they may be. This was also originally, I think, in one of the first drafts, a threshold criteria, council member, and then uh, this is a similar comment from the Citizens Oversight Committee to move that from a threshold criteria to a scoring criteria uh, so we don't box anybody out the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just sounds like we're awarding folks that are more of the same as opposed to, to something different. But again, I would also point out that's only two points out of the total 15 in that category you can I receive. Understand. Um, uh, I had one more question and now I'm forgetting it. Oh, uh, I noticed that the community engagement, which I think is a great idea, uh, looks like it's in here twice. Uh, you get item seven, which you do five points for community engagement, but there was another point uh, earlier, I can't remember exactly where, where, oh, under um, uh, item two, panel's feasibility review where you're scoring uh, zero to 10 points, a number of questions, including do they demonstrate a strong plan for community engagement? So are we, are we, are we doing that 
twice intentionally, or was that an oversight? I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a preference. I'm just curious. I, I think that's a, that's a good catch. It seems to be an oversight. I think we what we wanted to do was give that um, a more stricter bump, yeah. a more specific call out. So I think uh, it's a point well taken. I think we'll, we could probably delete that in the feasibility review since it already has its own section. Okay, and, mm -hmm. and last question, I promise, Mitch, is That's all right. um, uh, the, the, the chair asked you several questions about the process. I was concerned when I saw the, the review and selection process had so many steps. It, it looked to me as a veteran of the city that this was, you know, going to take two years. Oh. Uh, I, I understand that because you don't know how many applications you'll get, you can't guarantee a, a, a time frame. Although you, you did look a little freaked out when he said a month. Depends on how many we get. So it really does. I mean, I would speak to the county receiving 53. Right. That would be a challenge. Uh, so say we got 53. 53 possibly passing threshold and moving on to scoring might be a challenge. But I think we are fairly confident that we will get them done as soon as possible. So if we, if we got 53, would it take a month to do the threshold, or it would take... No, I'm speaking no. about the totality of the process. The to totality of the process. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. sure. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you for all those edits, and thank you, Mike, uh, for your contributions in that and catching that. Um, in talking about the design process, and I know this is something that Marquise and I have discussed previously as well, is there an opportunity, and I don't know if it would hinder or help, but taking advantage of the planning department's new design uh, suite, would that be something that could help accelerate uh, that consideration in this process? We'll definitely be uh, consulting with them as well as with the uh, mayor's new chief design officer as well to kind of develop that more specific rubric um, for that specific scoring criteria. I think that's a great, it's a great suggestion. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, one, uh, kudos to everybody who worked on this. Um, in uh, everyone in the city of Los Angeles does excellent work all the time. Um, this uh, work, however, I believe is outstanding and worthy of note, uh, given being a part of the discussion last time. It's, it's um, nice to be part of a committee where we lay things out and we get them back super, super clear like we did here. So um, congratulations on that and thank you. Um, I uh, wanted to just get a little bit more question, uh, a little bit more clarity about the one public comment that we had. Um, and they've submitted a letter about the, the bonding. Uh, and I know um, uh, we've, uh, you all have uh, sat me down and uh, tried to educate me on this bonding uh, process for a while, but I, I still remain uh, a little confused. Um, so, Mr. Spear, when the chair asked about it, you said that you don't anticipate projects having to wait on bonding. Did I understand that correctly? Presuming um, as planned in terms of what we have proposed for our budget going into next year, as well as the staff that we have dedicated in a lot of other units to process these applications, we should be able to manage the process. So the suggestion um, that has been brought to us is that we um, set a contingency if for some reason it's not the case that you can finish on time. Yes. Just uh, could you all give us your general opinion of such a, such a uh, backstop or, or catch? Yeah, so um, this in part is a broader discussion yeah. around sort of our, our um, bond issuance work that we do and the fact that we have seen a, an increase out, even outside of HHH in terms of the bond activity that uh, we've encountered. Um, we are, will be bringing forward to the council uh, within the next couple of weeks a bond uh, policy transmittal that will lay out revisions to both the existing city uh, council approved uh, bond policy as well as an MOU with uh, Cal HFA, the state's housing finance agency that would uh, permit for them to assist us where necessary with additional um, bond issuer capacity as needed. Um, we, we, at this point, we're thinking that they may help us to the greatest extent with our non-HHH 
activity, but certainly that MOU, once enacted, would allow them to also potentially help out on HHH if needed. So, so one of the things I wanted to add is the CAO Dead Group actually reviews all of the documents or the documents for the tax exempt bonds that HCID issues. And so we actually have been working with HCID to expedite the process as well so that we get the terms early enough so that when the documents are final, they're not delayed. Um, but I do want to say that one of the reasons why the CAO would not support allowing outside issuers is even if we have an outside issuer, issuer, if something goes wrong with the project, the city is still responsible. Because nobody cares who issued the bonds. <laughs> if, if, they're in this, if the project's in the city of LA and something goes wrong, we're responsible for that project and have to deal with the project. And I'm, uh, again, my apologies, and us having issued the bond as opposed to someone else makes a difference in that case, how? Well, only because, again, then we know that we, the documents are correct, that, that everything is in order, and then we, this HCID actually receives the fees from that issuance versus an outside entity, and the fees actually help support the staff that are issuing the bonds for HCID. If outside entity receives the funds and they just walk away, doesn't mean they're monitoring the project, right? So if something goes wrong, we're, you know, we end up with a project that maybe was never monitored by the issuer. Okay, and so what if, what if the project paid the fees so that you could monitor? That would help on that end, um, but I think to Yolanda's point, we have experienced um, situations with outside issuers in the past in terms of lack of compliance review, um, situations where even an issuer did not even know that six of their projects never actually started construction. I think they, at times though, there's a hope that in such a situation we would be able to work collaboratively. Our experience with them has sometimes been, I would describe as checkered. Uh, I think the added piece is that um, if there is something that goes wrong with that deal, it is the city that gets called. It is not the issuer. Mm -hmm. And I think, frankly, we are then on the hook for trying to address a situation where something may have gone wrong uh, that the issuer would have been able to step in and be able to correct earlier in the process. So it sounds like you all feel like the, the, this is a tool for quality control that you feel you seem to feel very strongly about yes got it all right thank you mr chair you bet mr okay. we're good all right um thank you thank you for this discussion uh, mr bonnet i hope a lot of your concerns were you know addressed um you brought up a few uh, of, of a few that we didn't really uh, dive into last time but we did dive into a real comprehensive request that the panel come back with um um, real defined uh, requirements in the RFP, and we appreciate that, uh, the work that you've done there. Um, what I'd like to do is, well, one of the concerns that I have is that beyond the $140,000 per unit sort of issue, um, um, I know it was envisioned with um, really no limitations up to the entire cost of the unit, which, which has always given me a little bit of heartburn because if, first of all, if we go beyond the $140,000 frequently, then we're going to run out of the money really quickly and we're going to end up building the entire unit, which um, doesn't sound like a bad idea, but that means that, that we'll have less product at, at the end of the day. Um, so it, it would seem to me that a reasonable approach would be to limit it uh, and cap it at 220, which is consistent with the overall HHH uh, process. Um, so, colleagues, what I'd like to do is um, approve the report um, and include in approving the report, um, I, I don't know exactly how to word this, but you, uh, you can help me, uh, CLA can help me with this, um, the panel feasibility review piece on the community engagement that is duplicative. Mm -hmm. So. Um, mitigate that duplication uh, in the recommendation um, along with um, 
approving the report with the amendment to the RFP, and that would be projects receiving additional Prop HH funds in excess of 140,000 per unit be capped at 220,000 per unit. Um, so those are my thoughts. If you all would like to discuss that or push back, or if you think that we, we should not limit it or not cap it, you know, let's hear it. But I, I, that's a concern that I have. Colleagues, thoughts? No? no? All right. Well, that's let's what. Let's see what we get in the first. In the first you know, yeah, we can always amend. We can always amend later. Mm -hmm. um, but those monies are going to go fast if we have a lot of proposers coming and saying, well, we want to, you to, the city to fund it at 400000 per unit or 500000 per unit. That money will disappear quickly. <clears throat> That's my concern. And I think we should be very judicious in going above 140. dollars mm -hmm. um, All right. Well, without objection, then that will be the order. Um, I want to have it. And in the meantime, someone has uh, filled out another comment card. So let's see what that is. Okay, the general. All right. So then it's general public. So we can um, we can go ahead and approve item four. So that that completes the agenda. However, we do have one general public comment um, from someone named Max. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So one minute for general public comment. And item three was already heard. So one minute for general public comment. Is a general this is it. General public comment, not re non related to any items, just yes. in between it's to change the related, based ballot. Related to homelessness and poverty. Yeah. Um, continued prosperity in Los Angeles will depend on providing needed parks because with the growth of a great metropolis here, the absence of parks will make living conditions less and less attractive, less and less wholesome. In so far, therefore, as the people fail to show the understanding, the courage, and organizing ability necessary, at this crisis, the growth of the region will tend to strangle itself. 1930, the Olmsted vision for the city of LA. My name is Rosa Max. Thank you. Um, all right. All the comment cards have been heard, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.